adoption of amendment number one as proposed by the planning board for the town zoning ordinance as follows amend article 10 to clarify that a certificate of occupancy may be suspended due to non-compliance with local requirements including failure to allow for required inspections replace the last paragraph of article 10.4.1 with the following in order to secure a certificate of occupancy, a structure must be found to be in compliance with all applicable requirements of this zoning ordinance, approved site plans, stipulations of local land use boards, and applicable state and local laws and regulations. All structures must be completed as approved. No, we need structures. Pardon? That's what I have. Oh, that's the old one. We're on the new ones. You just skipped one line down. So all structures must be completed as approved and applicable building permits. No new structures will be used or occupied without obtaining a certificate of occupancy. Failure to obtain a certificate of occupancy will constitute a violation of the zoning ordinance. Failure to maintain compliance with applicable state and local laws and regulations or failure to allow for necessary inspections to verify such compliance may result in the suspension of the certificate of occupancy. Purpose of the change, citizens should have a clear understanding of the circumstances in which a certificate of occupancy may be suspended. This new language clarifies the potential consequences for non-compliance or failure to allow for required inspections. Anybody on the board have any input on that? Anyone from the public have any input on Article 1? One? Or Amendment 1, sorry. All right, then does the board wish to vote to send this to our voters? Put it on the warrant. warrant. Is that, yeah, I guess we do it one by one then. Correct. Are we going to have a second public hearing? We will see. I mean, considering the weather, we might want to think about having a second okay. one. So why don't we wait until we get through all of them to decide what we'll do? Absolutely. Yes, we always wait until at least the end of the meeting. Yeah. See if more people show up. I mean, Would we have time to vote this at our next real meeting? Um, I'm just trying to remember. Yes, uh, we'll have time. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're it's slightly really ahead of schedule. Oh, good. I mean, the one possibility is we might have to move our meeting one way or another, but in general, yeah, I don't, I don't even think that's going to be necessary. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that everyone in the public has the opportunity to chime in. So, amendment number two. Are you in favor of the adoption of amendment number two as proposed by the planning board for the town zone ordinance as follows? Amend Article 10 to establish that detached accessory dwelling units may be permitted by special exception in zones where accessory dwelling units are currently permitted. Replace Article 10.8 with the following. Accessory dwelling unit. One accessory dwelling unit may be made in or added to the property of any single family home that lies within a zone where single family residence is permitted provided. Attached accessory dwelling unit shall be attached to the single family home by at least one interior door which may be locked. Detached accessory dwelling unit shall not encroach upon front side or rear setbacks and shall be permitted only by special exception. The accessory dwelling unit shall compromise no more than 35% or 750 square feet, whichever is greater, of the floor area of the entire structure or structures. Adequate sewerage shall be provided. Sufficient off-street parking shall be provided to accommodate all regular inhabitants of the accessory dwelling unit, and at least one off-street parking space shall be provided for use exclusively associated with the accessory dwelling unit. One of the dwelling units within the structure shall be the primary residence of the property owner. Why the change? Allowing accessory dwelling units has broadened the spectrum of affordable housing options for homeowners and renters alike. 
by allowing detached units through special exception in zones where attached units are currently allowed, another housing option would exist for those who can demonstrate that it will be done in a way that does not create a nuisance. We do have a letter here. Should we read it in the minutes? Uh, sure. You want me to read it? Or? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, to the Planning Board regarding Amendment 2, um, the gentleman writes, I am opposed to your change allowing a second dwelling unit on certain lots. It's one thing to have a mother-in-law apartment, but a second house on one lot should not be allowed. It would lower property values and reduce quality of life in existing residential areas. Uh, and he says in parentheses, like where I reside on Mountain View Drive. An example is an attached house on Winter Street recently completed. Zoning is supposed to protect property values, etc. This change could mean someone or family in a tiny house, RV, or converted chicken coop. And how about utilities and sewage? Thank you for considering my views. That comes from Calvin Brown at 62 Mountain View Drive. One of the board stops. Do we have any thoughts? It is worth considering. Um, and I don't have a lot of experience with it detached accessory dwelling as I know of one and that one was actually nicer than the original house so you know it can go the other way too um, where somebody's building a, a nicer sort of they're they're redoing and they're maybe you know this is why the, the, the special exception is important, I guess, to you know, have plans. I assume that um, if somebody wanted to convert a chicken coop, that this, when they bring their plans you know, to zoning, that that would come up as maybe not desirable. But I don't know. I don't it has to meet codes with a housing standard ordinance. A dwelling unit has to meet all of the state building codes. Yeah, so I don't put it so, everyone else thinks. It would have to have sewage, it would have to have electricity, running water, right. all those amenities. What well, they're not the amenities. It's going to lower <laughs> or raise property values and kind of It would have to be pretty shabby, I would think. I mean, if you have, it's no different than an apartment building, its value is higher than a regular home. So I don't know. I can I, see I, I'm not an assessor. Because like on this cul-de-sac, if everybody in there put in an accessory dwelling, that would become pretty dense. But I don't think they'd be able to meet the setback requirements in that area. Well, that's why I, an accessory dwelling. I thought they should be in there. Um, the, the example that's being mentioned in here on Winter Street, it's attached. So did somebody do an accessory, an attached accessory dwelling unit on Winter Street to another building? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that was referring to. And, right, I mean, the change, the change that's being proposed, I mean, right, attached is already allowed, we all know this. It's already allowed, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, so so I'm, not, I'm not sure, I don't understand that. So I don't see why it would be an example to right. what we're proposing, which is detached. Right. Um, Dara, you said that you were getting some applications for this sort of thing. What sort of projects or people um, so I we there was a variance was applied for to allow for detached on Hill Road it was granted um, what kind of dwelling was it it Can you was I think it was a garage that was converted to a dwelling unit I don't I can't say ex exact certainty it was an existing building and in this case, it was actually being used. I think someone, there were like curtains hanging on it when the guy bought it. When the, the, the guy, the gentleman who owns it now bought it. So it was probably being used, you know. So a, somebody was illegal using yeah. a garage and they made it legal? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but people do, I think garage is what is commonly, you know, people want to maybe build a, two, uh, a garage with a, with a dwelling unit above it. And they don't want to have to attach it to the house. That's that's a fairly common inquiry. I think that's probably going to be pretty common. Yeah, or barns, I guess. 
Could we look at the fifth bullet down of the second one up? Sufficient off street parking. I don't know if it's me, but isn't the first part of the sentence saying the same thing as the second part of the sentence? If you have off street parking provided to accommodate the inhabitants of an accessory dwelling unit, why do you still need at least one off street parking space? For use exclusively associated with accessory dwelling. I, I have. Can I say why? I yeah, because it is it. So the the last one, the, the second part is pretty absolute. You know, you got to have at least one parking space. It's exclusively for that. The, the second, the first part says kind of gives the code enforcement officer the option to go above and beyond that if he if he or she discovers that um, that. Uh, they don't, the one's not enough. It's saying you got to provide sufficient parking to accommodate all regular inhabitants of the inhabitants of the AU. So if they've got, you know, uh, let's say a, a couple living there and they constantly have two cars parked there and they've only provided the one space and it's resulting in on street parking, then because that first part is there, the code enforcement officer can go and say, hey, You've got to add another space but here. You're not accommodating the. Do we remember we're talking about a 750 square foot space? How many parking spaces could you possibly need? I, th and hopefully I mean, just one, and that's where the, se the regular, second part covers the, the what we expect to be the norm, which is only one space will be needed. But the first part allows for. Um, so yeah, it's sufficient. If somebody's constantly, you know, let's say they got two or three cars, and, and the then you can go to the property owner and say, look, you, you're, you're, according to our zoning ordinance, you need to provide sufficient off-street parking to accommodate all regular inhabitants of the ADU. If all regular inhabitants, for some reason, have three cars, then we're going to require that they come up with a way to get those three cars. But what if nobody in the ADU drives a car? You said they, they have would, sufficient... They got to have one. In that case, they would have so to have the it one. says no. It says sufficient off-street parking should be provided to accommodate all regular inhabitants of the ADU. Right. So what if, if nobody in the ADU is? Let's say there's three people living then in that. Then zero room. spaces would be sufficient off-street parking to accommodate all those regular inhabitants. That's not what it says. Well, actually, it says it sufficient off-street parking shall be provided yeah. to accommodate all regular inhabitants. It doesn't say motor vehicles or drivers. This is all inhabitants. So you yeah. could have three people living in an ADU. They have never driven a car in their life, never intend to, but you've got to have three parking spaces no. for them because no. that's what it says. It, no, it, it doesn't. Sufficient, so. It says sufficient off street parking. It doesn't say a space, ha there has to be a space for each person that lives there. That's what it does. No, it doesn't. To accommodate all regular inhabitants of the ADU? They're not going to live in the parking spaces. No, but, it says you're going to provide them for all regular inhabitants okay, so, of the so, ADU. So, okay, let's say then, how about this? We say sufficient off-street parking shall be provided to accommodate the vehicles of all regular inhabitants of the ADU. Well, if you're concerned about having at least one, why don't you say there shall be at least one off-street parking space provided for use exclusively associated with the accessory dwelling unit? Because then if somebody's rent, consistently renting to couples, and who always have two cars, then that first part allows the code enforcement officer to, to go and say, all right, you need two spaces in this case. I mean, what are you trying to prevent here? The um, car has to, whether honestly, they have, I mean, we have lots down here. We have a couple in the village area or downtown area that don't have parking on their property. Yeah. So they have to park somewhere, right. but they have to park legally somewhere. So why does the planning board care where they park, whether it's on their property or off their property? Well, and we address that in another <laughs> amendment um, by saying, because um, when, when we met last time, um, you guys sort of came up with the idea that we wanted to add an amendment that said you've got to have two for, for um, you've got to have two spaces off street parking spaces. And I took that and I wanted to put words to it and I thought, okay, we don't want to say they we don't want to say absolutely they must be on the same parcel. So the wording is saying um, 
they've got to have, you know. It's close proximity. But this isn't new yeah, wording. Right. This wording is already in the zoning. Uh, not exactly. Sufficient Off Street Park should be fried to accommodate all regular inhabitants of the ADU, and at least one Off Street Parking space should be fried to use. Yes, it is. Okay. The that particular amendment bullet. two language, or the one I was just talking about. Okay. The sufficient off street okay. parking. Yeah, yeah. Hold off just a second. Did you have any problems? My only question was going to be is when you get to um, uh, detached dwelling, uh, seven hundred fifty square feet is like thirty by twenty five. Uh, whether or not any kind of mobile home structure would qualify, because if that does, then I could see where any, if we allow small, smaller uh, mobile homes to qualify if you're in a real residential neighborhood and a bunch of these started showing up on property, that could, in fact, depreciate the value of someone's property. I believe that's not allowed to have Nope. Mobile homes since 1995 or something? Well, you take a mobile home and you, and you put it up and you take the wheels out from it and put it up on cement blocks, it becomes then a home, even though you're in a mobile home park, it, it might be. You know, if you want to follow me on that, right. because, you know, you don't want those popping up all over the place either. Uh, I agree. Um, but I haven't read any <coughs> mobile homes aren't allowed. I don't know. What it says... No manufactured housing shall be located within the town of Tilton except in a manufactured housing park or a manufactured housing subdivision. So you could not put manufactured housing in your backyard. I'm not going to argue, but I also know that a lot of the homes nowadays which are prefabs are in fact, they bring them in in two pieces and put them together and they get a lot of those like up in Jensen's in that area. And I would call those manufactured housing, but maybe they're not called that by the time. That's a good point because it should be differentiated. Well, like the tiny homes come in on a trailer. They're on wheels. They do. Right. So would a tiny house be an ADU, Mr. Derry? No. What's that? Would a tiny house be an ADU? Well, potentially if it's... Are they manufactured? They're on wheels. The... Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that may be a question for Al. I, I think the, um, the uh, a, a tiny house in my mind would normally, would, would qualify as an ADU. Um, the, you have to be what sticky. exactly qualifies something as manufactured <clears throat> housing, I feel like we have defined, but, you know, um, I guess if, if a tiny house were on a steel carriage or something, um, so manufactured housing, the definition of manufactured housing shall be in accordance with RSA 670431 as men. Mm -hmm. Manufactured housing means any structure transportable in one or more sections, which in the traveling mode is eight body feet from or more in width and 40 body feet in length, and when erected is cited, 320 square feet or more. I, su I'm not, I won't keep reading this, but I, I feel like it's possible that there is some tiny house out there that would possibly qualify as both a manufactured house and potentially <coughs> an ADU. However, Catherine and Julia are right that our zoning ordinance says manufactured housing can only be in a park or a subdivision. So, if there was that tiny house that happened to qualify as both, then I guess it would be restricted because it can also be defined as a manufactured housing or mobile home, which wouldn't be allowed. Well, you could have tiny homes all over the place with this ordinance because it doesn't have to say, this doesn't say it has to be. 750 square feet. Right. It says it can't be greater than. Right. So yes. you can certainly build it smaller than. Absolutely. And whether it's on axles or not, or taken off an axle and put on the ground, people could build tiny homes. Because there's no minimum size. I mean, there is a minimum. 
feel like it needs more work as far as definitions and the definitions is the state. No, I mean as far as the detached part, I'm just thinking, you know. And maybe our definitions too. So this verbiage what came mean. from the state there. Our um, definition is this from the state. Oh. I mean, if you look at this, they can have an attached accessory dwelling unit. An attached, right. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's and I think that's it does, the attached one yeah. doesn't say it has to meet any side setbacks. I mean, it should with their ordinance, but if they build a detached one, what's the difference if it's attached to the house or not? Well. What's the difference? They could say, if they qualify for this detached, and they meet front and side or rear setbacks, and say, um, say no, you can't have it detached. They say, okay, well, then I'll attach it. Well, you can't attach a mobile home. Right? You could, but... Well, you can't put a mobile home on a residential lot. You can't, correct. You could put a prefabricated off-site yeah. that you bring on-site, like Chuck was describing. Right. That as long as it's no bigger than 750 square feet, but yeah. like I said, if I came in and said I want a building permit, I'm going to build a detached accessory dwelling unit on my lot. And yes, I meet these. And okay, yes, you do. Well, no, we don't allow it in town. I said, okay, well, I'll just attach it then. Yeah. Even though we don't specify that the attached have to meet the setback. They couldn't get a building permit without a building True. meeting the sector. True, that is true, yes. Just yes. curiosity. Someone decides that they want to just add on to their house. So they go ahead and add on to their house. At one point, does it become an attached dwelling? And when does someone, if they all of a sudden, mother-in-law, father-in-law, whatever, moves in, uh, to the house, but it's a flow right into it, into into part of that living space. How does that, and when does that, and who defines that as an attached dwelling, and how does that be impacted by this, rather than someone who just adds on to their house, somebody else moves in. You don't you don't judge who moves in and out of homes. So I, don't, I that's a little confusing to me. That's all. Um, yeah, dwelling, we do define dwelling unit. So um, there's sort of this point where um, a single residential dwelling unit com um, provides complete and independent living facilities in a range intended and designed for occupancy by a single household. So dwelling, or excuse me, I'm reading the one below it. A dwelling unit, a building or portion thereof pro provide, it's a grammatic layer there, but it should be that provides, I guess, living facilities for one or more households. So if you've got, you know, a portion of a building that's sectioned off and capable of providing somebody's dwelling needs, for lack of a better term, then you've got a dwelling unit. So an addition could be turned into a dwelling unit by adding doors and necessary kitchen and bathroom facilities. Right, it only becomes a bedroom if it's just a room. Mm -hmm. It's not a dwelling unit unless it has separate, right. yeah. separate bathroom, separate kitchen. I guess I would just, do we want to move on, or do we want to go back to the parking? I think that parking line needs to be written differently. I mean, it is in our current zoning. But so, do, could I ask, 
uh, Chairman Tillman, can I just? Yes. All right. So, um, so what if? Um, are you, it sounds almost like you were think you're thinking the whole first part of that sentence could go away. Did I? Is that right? I think so. Um, Why? Well, I, I I mean I don't really know the intent. You know, maybe the code enforcement officer has run up against issues, and that's why it's written this way. I mean, I, but, you know, it seems to me the first part of the sentence is saying the same thing the second part. I, I don't is. think so. I, I do believe this is a creation of my own head, um, unless I'm forgetting that I took it from somewhere a year ago and I don't remember. But, and I, I do believe my intent was to say, Okay, you got to have at least one parking space, but above and beyond, potentially above and beyond that, if you're if somebody's renting regularly to people who have more than one car, they've got to accommodate that as well, or uh, again, above and beyond that one. And I feel so, like this sentence to me when I read it, that's what it says. Then why don't you but take the, off the word sufficient? and say off-street parking shall be provided to accommodate all regular inhabitants of the ADU. Okay. Yeah, I like it. Does that That's fine with me. I know how you do it. Does that do it though? Does I it think it does. Yeah, okay. it, doesn't, it doesn't diminish what I was trying to accomplish at all. Okay, good. More parking. Amendment number three. Are you in favor of the adoption of Amendment No. 3 as proposed by the Planning Board of the Town Zoning Ordinance as follows? Amend Articles 3 and 10 to establish that requires, required residential off-street parking shall be exclusively designated and within immediate proximity of the associated dwelling unit. Replace the first paragraph of Article 3.5 with the following. Except in the downtown district, off-street parking shall be exclusively designated for a particular use and provided within the immediate proximity of the associated use as enumerated in the following table. Prior to approval of any new use, change of use, or expansion of use in the downtown district, the planning board and or code enforcement officer may require verification that existing public parking will provide adequate public accommod parking accommodations. Replace Article 10.9 with the following. Off-street parking. Two exclusively designated off-street parking spaces within the immediate proximity of the associated unit are required for each unit in condominium, apartment, or multi-family dwellings. Why the change? This amendment clarifies that required off-street parking requirements can only be satisfied by exclusively designated parking spaces located within the immediate vicinity of the associated unit. Any comments from the board? So the first paragraph of Article 3.5 is not here, right? Um, it's really just those bold italic words being added to it. Okay, so there's nothing, everything else is exactly the same. Yes. So we don't even have to say replace, but just add this whole verbiage, right? I'm just saying um, so we can compare it and make the decision. Yeah. I mean, the, the, if I wrote, this is the easiest way to, to me, the cleanest way to create this document is to just say we're replacing an entire paragraph with this paragraph and show try and highlight the changes by using bolding or strike through or whatever. If I were to just write a bunch of words and say these are going to be stuck in, you know, these different places in paragraph 3.5, I feel like it would be harder to follow. But yeah, for, from a practical standpoint, that's what's happening. We could, yeah. So. so when they go to actually decide, you know, when we present this, we're going to have the, the original paragraph there to compare it then, right? Because no, they don't I know. That, that. My plan was to have it just this like it is here. Would see this was the one they would see, but then they're going to be like, geez, I wonder what Article 3.5 said originally. Um, all right, I can look at that. I, it, this, by doing it this way, you get less 
right, busy. It's easier yeah. for you. And I feel, no, <laughs> not for me. I, or maybe, not really. Well, okay. I, no, it's supposed to be easier for the reader um, and less messy for the reader. Uh, and to me, the bolding and strike through, the use of bolding and strike through, you know, right. well, gives maybe, you what you're you know, looking replace for. Replace the first paragraph of R3.5 and then make a note, you know, the bold text is what's being, I don't know, somehow okay. word it that way that you know that you don't have to go and look it up because it's everything okay. here. It's kind of a cleanup article because our ordinance right now shows that they got to have two in our chart, but it doesn't say that in. So how does that? Yeah. At ten point nine. <laughs> All right. Article four. Reference to outdoor life. Are you in favor of the adoption of amendment, oh, amendment number four as proposed by the Planning Board for the Town Voting Ordinance as follows? Amend Article 2 to remove the current requirement that article <coughs> lighting be shut off by 11 p.m. Remove article, uh, item M from Article 2.4.4. Strike out 2.4.4 completely, which was Parking lot lighting shall be shut off by 11 p.m. unless a specific scheduled event requires parking lot lighting will be left on until the event is finished. In this situation, the light shall be shut off within a reasonable period of time following the end of the event. Why the change? For years now, businesses have been keeping their lights on past 11 p.m. Multiple businesses in town legally remain open past 11, and it could be unsafe to limit their ability to maintain well-lit grounds. Even businesses that are not open past 11 p.m. may not find that public safety is enhanced when they keep their lights on at night. Catherine, you good? No. Okay. Well, wait. <laughs> well, it's, it, I've said it before. It's, um, you know, we have prob problems like in Lowe's when that was built. Those residents on well, the southwest side of it, the light pollution. We had a lot, there was a lot of negotiation to alleviate for those people. And uh, part of it was shut, some, shutting some of the lights off and shields and whatnot. Um, a lot of our commercial area butts up against residential. Um, across from Lowe's, that new development butts up against a residential area. We had a long conversation with them when they came in about, you know, light pollution in, in that residential neighborhood. Um, I think we could, instead of just eliminating it, um, maybe we could, I mean, unless a special, specific event they can keep it on, but what if they, if they do remain open, why couldn't we just add that? Or if they are, you know, let's say we have a business open 24 hours. Why would we have them shut their parking lot lights off if they're open 24 hours? Mm -hmm. But so if you have a business, say, the, yeah. let's say the size of Lowe's, they close, why do all those parking lot lights have to be on? Couldn't they build it in such a way that they could shut off anything beyond 50 feet from the building or 40 feet from the building, I don't know, whatever is. Because along with this, we also have, in D, um, mounting heights for those parking lot lights should not exceed 15 feet. Can we adopt some sort of thing about, like, uh, having a, what is it called, dark skies compliance sort of that's, isn't there some kind of best, you know, we all don't want light pollution. Right, there is something a... Something generic that's like, we don't want light pollution, but of course if there's a business open, then they should have the option to have their lights on, but in all other cases, try to just mitigate the light pollution. Well, I know when you're coming down 93, you can tell where exit 20 is by the glow in the sky. 
But I'm just saying, I think we could, instead of eliminating it, we could write this differently. That allows us to do just that, control some light pollution, but also accommodate the business. Don't we have the ability already to do that by individual cycling? To a certain extent, I think we do. So if we remove this... I don't think we have that negotiability. No? I don't think so. What's to negotiate? We don't have it there to negotiate it. Conditions of approval. Is it, is it what they do with their lighting? But what would we have to have in an ordinance to put teeth into that? I don't know. That's what I mean. I, I'm thinking instead of eliminating it, rewriting it to make it more user friendly for the planning board. And somebody coming in and building hopefully would look at our zoning to know what they're Maybe up against and say, all right. Start. Maybe there's a, some sort of best management practices thingy about it. Yes, Derek? Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was a, any input over here? Yes. For a business, manufacturing business that open, is open around the clock 24 hours, they would want to maintain their parking lot lights on, including have an impact on this bill. That's what we're trying to... We that, that's part of the whole... And I would think that a large manufacturing like that, you're talking large-scale manufacturing, would not be in a residential area, but it might be in just how our town has grown. Something might have grown around it. So that's a very good point. Why so we can't we can't address this in site plan? We usually do. Oh we do. And it makes sense. On an individual basis regarding the neighbors and, and regarding the neighborhood. We spend a lot of time on, on lights. I think it's because we have this in there. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. I feel like I, removing that does not. I I would, you know, I would <clears throat> still hold that the planning board has the right to regulate lighting in such, to, especially if it's to make sure it's not going to be a nuisance to abutting properties. I mean, sure. Anytime you move, remove technical regulation, it, it does remove teeth, but I think the planning board's right to regulate nuisance lighting is, is, is well established. Where? Um, in, uh, in RSA and in practice, I mean, that's, it's, it'd be hard to imagine a planning board meeting in the state of New Hampshire where uh, lighting is involved that the planning board doesn't delve into it and potentially ask for you know changes from the original plan and it, it's not done by pointing to a particular place in the ordinance it's done as a matter of a very clear uh, authority that planning boards have <clears throat> Yeah, I, I tend to agree, but I wouldn't you say, you don't have the authority. No, oh, we've had I mean, judges tell us we don't have the authority. I mean, it's just, it's very hard to get an email in here. Yeah, I think, I think if we have this. Yeah, that's the point. Thing. I just want to know. Like I said, I'd like to see it rewritten differently. I don't want to eliminate it altogether. That's just me. Um. So, so what if we, what if it said parking lot lighting shall not, yeah, I guess I'm not ready to just throw out language, but let's say the gist of it was parking lot lighting shall not um, create a nuisance to
Um, I mean, we could go in some direction of that. Just just saying parking, it, it's kind of, I mean, it's not really replacing this. It's a statement that could go com somewhere completely out, and I'm not sure it's not already somewhere in the lighting ordinance, to be honest, but just say something like, parking lot lighting cannot create a nuisance to surrounding properties. Yes. It, the purpose in, in your lighting uh, ordinance already says to improve safety and security, promote energy <coughs> efficiency, reduce lighting which is detrimental to the environment or to public use and enjoyment of public and private property, and to preserve and promote the historic character of Tilton. Now, I think if you're going to just simply, I got a bunch of questions, but like, what is a parking lot? If you call a parking lot a structure, well, how many cars? If you don't control things in a residential neighborhood, then it doesn't have to be downcast lighting. You can put in those street lights that can, you know, flare up everywhere. There's all kinds of things. It, so when, uh, you know, but until some of those things I think are carefully defined to come in and to remove this is just kind of opening, in my estimation, Pandora's box for anybody who wants excessive outdoor lighting to just go ahead and put it in. The other thing, too, is that there's some contradictions because 2.4.4 talks about sports events have to end at 1130, but if there's no I mean, there's got to be a parking lot. So the parking lot will stay on. And yet, 2.4.6 says rodeos are exempt from anything. And they're a sports <laughs> event. So there's some basic contradictions. Yeah. And I guess mm -hmm. I would like to see the planning board maybe look at the whole ordinance and get rid of some of these contradictions and please include the differences between the different districts. Your signage is very clear about what you can have in rural agricultural, what you can have in the resort commercial and industrial, but for lighting, it's one size fits <coughs> all. And if I fully understand, if somebody is open 24 hours a day, they better have lights in their walking off. But they can come to you and say, I'm open 24 hours, give me a conditional approval or whatever the term is, I don't know the names. And you can grant that, that's your right. And yet, if I'm in a rural agricultural district and I have space in my front yard for eight parking spots, I shouldn't be allowed to put up lights. And what determines that? My neighbor has three spots that he can park cars in. Is he a parking lot? And it just seems that this is a little bit fuzzy at this point, and maybe we ought to just step back and look at the whole ordinance. Yes? In, in concert with what those two had uh, alluded to as well, I guess my comment on just the word nuisance is, is very subjective and what's a nuisance to one person may not be a nuisance to another. However, from a lighting standpoint, it is how many lumens or what, what is the area of coverage and how, how does it portray the, the light pattern? Obviously, for, for safety, you need areas well lit for, for those that are that are open or whatever I would imagine. But I guess from a definition, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the lighting ordinance or, or whatever, but in terms of this component, maybe some conflict. Yes, sir. So I think uh, Chuck read a section of the ordinance that gives an example of how the planning board has authority to kind of generally regulate light. And then um, right above the sec the 15 foot um, re requirement that Catherine was referring to is a statement that says any light shining onto adjacent property or street which results in light trespass, nuisance glare, or a disabling glare shall not be permitted. So we, we have a real problem here. We have a regulation that's virtually unenforceable. I mean, if we were to send Al out tomorrow, tell everyone they have to shut their lights off at 11 o'clock from now on in the town of Tilton, we'd have a crisis on our hands. So that's why 
I, for the second time, this is appearing as a potential zoning amendment. And you know, if the it's it seems to me that the the, the hesitancy on the planning board to adopt this was for out of fear that you would no longer be able to regulate nuisance lighting or, or lighting in general um, at the site plan review level. And here again, with the, the example that Chuck provided and this this one that I just read, it's very clear that the planning board does have the authority without it, with the removal of this 11 p.m. Um, which, you know, Kathy's point out is, is not in, it, it, it's out of whack with some of the other pieces of the ordinance. Removing this will not remove the planning board's authority to regulate lighting during site plan review. And it, it's, it's important, this is important. We have a regulation in here that is virtually, I mean, for all intents and purposes, unenforceable. Uh, well, I have a question, it may be silly, but one can I turn my lights back on? Well, if I turn them off 11, can I turn it back on at midnight? Right, true. Is it <laughs> or can I turn it back on at 11 <laughs> one? Yeah, I don't know. I'm asking. I'm, I'm, I'm no, being nice. a little sarcastic, but I'm also no. But you're serious. making a good point. No, no, it's true. Yeah, I, that's a good point. I, I spent a lot of time in the last two years driving around this town, this town, late at night, and there's a lot of lights on. So almost every business that's coming to this town is violating this. Mm -hmm. Right. It's true, and I don't like that either. Um, that is not. It's. I don't know who wrote that originally, but. And we've approved things without considering that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, the reference above the 1130 and all of that is specific to um, outdoor recreational facilities. This one is generic parking lot lighting. Like I said, I think it should be rewritten and not just left out. But it also it isn't just light glare. I mean, it is light glare and not maybe not necessarily, you know, an abutting property nuisance. But if we leave this in <laughs> written better. <laughs> Eric makes a good point. It allows us to say, okay, um, you're going to stay open until 12, so your lights, you know, how many lights can, because they're going to build it, how many lights can you make it so that they're shut off by 12 p.m. so we don't have all the lights in the parking lot? Um, like I said, I mean, so talk about unenforceable. This lighting ordinance and grandfathering, um, if you look at 2.4.7, all lighting installations must be brought into compliance with the provision of this chapter within 10 years of its effective date. Well, guess what? 10 years has come and gone since this was adopted. And um, that means that everybody, all these commercial businesses that exit 20, Better have the lights on 15 foot poles and nothing taller. So it isn't just one of these that might be hard. And it's not, nothing's ever impossible to enforce, but everybody's got to be in compliance with this. 2009 is when this was adopted. Yep. March of this year, 10 years. Everybody's going to be in compliance with this. There's no more grandfather. Code enforcement's going to be busy. Code <laughs> enforcement's going to be busy. Uh, yes. I, in fact, in the past, have been a, 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 what I would call a real violator. Years ago, I had uh, a lot of people, we used to put street lights out by their you know, garages and things. So I decided to get rid of, like, uh, uh, 150 watt. Uh, floodlight. So I went out and bought one of these uh, high pressure sodium lights. And I'm sure you all, when I describe this, you understand it had a flat back mm -hmm. against the building and it had a little round canister that came down and it was only like a 25 or 30 watt bulb in there. But let me tell you that high pressure sodium light, cast light, and you, I could see it from miles away and it not only shone and lit up my whole yard, but the next door neighbor's house, I could see it right all over the side of their house. You know, I finally decided just to get rid of it. But, I mean, those are things that people have all the time, and those are not downcast. 
And, I mean, this this is an issue everywhere. I mean, you know where I live, Julie. I'm up on the hill, up on the corner of Caleb Hill Road, Match Road, and you ought to come up there on a clear night and take a look. It's an unbelievable the amount of lake pollution in town. But I think also there is a public safety issue in any parking lot, public parking lot, places where people who live downtown and have to park in the back. So I don't know, did you just pull this thing out? I don't know. It's, it's, I think the whole ordinance really needs a lot of work. Well, after March, the code enforcement officer is going to have to enforce um, whether or not inside lighting <laughs> is a nuisance. That's number N, right underneath the one that's being suggested to change. I mean, Chuck has a point, but. That's <clears throat> yes, there is a. I, I mean, I think there, there are, um, <laughs> so a lot of uh, points have been made about other improvements that could be made to this ordinance. But we've got this one in front of us right now. We've got this relatively, I would say, I don't want to dramatize things, but a pretty serious issue. You have this requirement in your zoning ordinance that lights be shut off by 11 p.m. And there's, there, we are absolutely not doing that. And I don't know, I can't imagine anyone in this room thinks it's a good idea to have the code enforcement officer start enforcing an 11 o'clock deadline throughout the town of Tilton. That's, that's what I'm trying to address here. I'm, I'm not, by putting this in, suggesting this, suggest, mm -hmm. trying to say that every other aspect of the lighting ordinance is in perfect shape. But it, to, to like continue to ignore this glaring, excused upon, um, issue, because we can say, well, it could be done in a more holistic manner with more contemplation, I think is probably not the best approach. Oops, sorry. Yes. I'm concerned about the comment that it's unenforceable, so we should get rid of it when there are a lot of things in this town that are not in force. And if we start down that slippery slope, we might as well get rid of 90% of our town ordinances. And I guess, I think that this is something that the planning board could revisit, bring back next year. Al does not have to go out tomorrow and start, or the day after a town meeting, and start enforcing things. He hasn't enforced them for the last year or two, so let's just keep on the way things are, fix this up, make it right, make it something that will be enforceable or will say what you really want. And you also get me the purpose that you yourselves have listed, which is promoting the historic nature of the town and doing the safety as well as efficiency, as well as thinking about lighting. I, I just, I don't think it's acceptable for all of us to be paying this much attention to this specific language in the zoning ordinance and to leave here tonight saying, we're going to leave it as it is and we're going to agree not to enforce it. I, we, I, I, certainly there are other things that, that aren't enforced in this world, in this, in this, uh, on this zoning ordinance. But to have something twice before the board that is clearly out of whack and to twice turn it back and say, ah, we'll deal with it another time. And in the meantime, Al, you just keep, keep ignoring it. I don't think that's the right approach. I don't think we'd ever tell Al to keep ignoring anything. Well, that's what, it's either we're all agreeing that he's not going to enforce it or we need to, or <coughs> I guess we're saying we want him to go out and start shutting lights down at 11 o'clock throughout town. One more comment? Yes. I think if there are areas where there are abuses, and it, whether it's Lowe's or something else, and the businesses are closed, and they close at 9 o'clock, and there are abuses, at least this would allow some leverage to be able to go in and say, hey, turn your lights off, or turn them off, or half of them off, or most of them off, 
No one is trying to have, you know, an issue of public safety. I think that's a, that's a concern, but there is enough light pollution in this town already. We don't need any more. And to, to just take away the ability that the town has to go in and have somebody because otherwise you're going to have every individual in town who's going to have to tell them to come down to the planning board and, and uh, are you going to go stack the planning board on the stack going around neighborhoods and saying, oh, by the way, there's a violation of one of our purposes, therefore we're going to tell these people to turn their light off. At least if you have an ordinance that says that, you can do something. Anyway. Back to Eric's point, it doesn't say hours like I would be happier if it said you know we want dark hours from midnight to dawn that would be much better than shut them off at 11 oh, okay I did and then I turn them right back on so it doesn't say but a lot of these companies have a lot of these businesses have deliveries that are made at four or five in the morning and they need to have some kind of light. It, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Mitchell mentioned that, you know, the historic nature of the town and things like that, but we started down this road a long time ago, <coughs> long before many of us were on this board. And, you know, we, we can't, this is not enforceable. It, it is a clear violation. Just everything we've done as a board with different things that we've approved, they, they leave the lights up. You know, some of them have switched over to LED lighting, which goes to the energy savings. But, you know, now they leave their lights off. Some places choose to turn their lights off, you know, part, part of their lights off. But, again, it's still, a, it's still a safety issue and a liability issue. It's a time to take on the liability if, you know, using the example that Mr. Mitchell did of Lowe's, we tell them to shut their lights off. Well, you know, someone goes up there and causes trouble. And because we made them shut their lights off, are we taking the liability for for that, and, and, I, and I have a hard time that the town's going to accept liability because we're enforcing, uh, enforcing an ordinance that doesn't work anymore. The town has changed, and, and because of planning and, and things like that, it's just not a, it's a, not where I got my drink tonight, they leave the lights on 24 hours a day. Do we need to make them shut them off at 12 noon because they're making it extra bright at 12 noon? I don't know, you know, but their lights are on. Three in the morning, three in the afternoon. It's the same lights that are all on. All the lights are on, and they all have LED energy efficient lights. So what's the difference? You know, it's, it, I, I go by the outlets at night. Some of the lights are off, but around the, the, the front stores, they're on. The middle part of the parking lot, they're on all night long. You know, and you go you go by most of the business in town. They're on, and they're on for a reason. Maybe it's their insurance company requires them to be on because of liability issues. The police department, a, paper, a safety issue, the police department can see things better than if the lights aren't on, uh, if the lights are on. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, I have a hard time. Is, now, yeah. do I want my next door neighbor? You know, have it, do I want to live next door to Mr. Mitchell with his thousand watt <laughs> light glaring in my thing like they did in one? Well, <laughs> no, but in like the movie Christmas Vacation, you know, they turn the Christmas lights on, woo, and that was, <laughs> That was that. I don't want that next door to me. I have a street light in front of my house that shines in my bedroom. I'd rather have that street light just because I know it's for safety. Because I want to be able to see people walking by my house in the middle of the night. And, and, I, and I, you know. And that's another thing. Like, who defines the nuisance? In that case, you don't see it as a nuisance. Mm -hmm. but well, my neighbors may. But your neighbors may. So that, that's, that's a, count, that's a, a very that's complicated issue. Every source of whoever decides to put the street lights on. Yeah. I would add that there's a difference to me in permanent lighting around the building for safety, especially where deliveries are being made, than necessarily lighting the entire parking lot that is not used there. Right. And we, I think, yeah, you know, yeah, of course we want to see more dark skies when we can, but. How? Well, a lot of that, why a lot we of should have this in here? Not I don't downcast. know. The light that he's describing against buildings, a lot of that's not downcast. It's, it's right. just like he described. It's got the flat back and it's going into the building, and it lets out a lot more light. Where a lot of the downcast lighting, this parking lot lighting, is downcast because the top of the pole is going down. Yeah. But 
what is the view of the board on this particular portion of the lighting? You're saying keep it in. Leave it in. You're saying take it out. The board's got to know, hey, hey, oh, oh. Number four has got to know. <laughs> Wait, you mean, I mean number four needs to stay, is what you're saying, Order. right? Remove no. item no. He, he, he wants it. it. He wants this as written. Remove it. Yeah, remove it's item Okay, no. so number four. He's with you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I thought we were going to vote on these. Yeah, we're going to vote on later. I'm just trying to get the old oh, item on the board. So in general, I, I think it's just, yeah. I mean, we, we should look at the lighting for sure. Uh, the lighting issue by... It's so complicated. In Plymouth, I think, you know, they do it by a, a street light, by light bulb, by light bulb. Yes. Yes, they did that for a while. It's so complex, and each light means something different to, to each abutter. I mean, um, yeah, it's like, it's just looking at it as, as it is, it has to go, because it shouldn't have been written like that. Any more conversation on number four? On to number five, small scale manufacturer. Amendment number five. Are you in favor of the adoption of amendment number five as proposed by the planning board for the town zoning ordinance as follows? Amend articles two and six to define small scale manufacturing and establish that such uses may be allowed through special exception in a mixed use, regional commercial, resort commercial, general commercial, downtown, rural <coughs> agricultural and industrial districts, and not permitted in the village residential and medium residential districts. Add to Article 2 definitions the following term. Small scale manufacturing, a use engaged in the production of food product or other goods in which such production results in no impact or minimal impact to surrounding properties as determined through a special exception hearing for the zoning board of, a, yeah, zoning board of adjustment. Add to Article 6.1e, a line titled Small Scale Manufacturing, and designate that such uses are allowed by special exception in MURG, RC, GC, DNRA, and IN, and not permitted in VR and MR. Why the change? According to the Manufacturing Institute, over 40% of manufacturing firms employ four or fewer people, and it seems these small firms could play a role in revitalizing our downtown, which would include significant levels of manufacturing during other prosperous times in its past. Such uses would be allowed only after a special exception hearing, including a butter notification, and such a use would not be permitted in the MR, VR districts, which are designated primarily for residential use. Would you like to read Mr. Propsy's letter? Uh, yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, dear Ms. Tilton, due to a prior commitment, I am unable to attend the planning board session directed towards an amendment of Articles 2 and 6. Mm -hmm. I do not know about any specific complaints that have been directed to the board concerning offensive small-scale manufacturing uses that have become a problem in town. However, I need to point out some salient facts. And then he has bullets here. It is completely counterintuitive that such a use would require a special exception in an industrial district. It is almost as great a leap of logic that such a use would require a special exception in the regional commercial, general commercial, and downtown districts. Depending upon the definition of small-scale manufacturing, there is sound reasoning for restrictions in the village residential, medium residential, and to a lesser degree, resort commercial and rural agricultural districts. Specifics about definitions are likewise of great importance. Small scale would include operations as small as a single person employed part-time and the self-employed. Moreover, manufacturing concerns any item made. The unintended consequences to itemize but a few of this change would result in bullets, a prohibition on maple syrup production in the agricultural district. Cooking it off might be permitted, but not bottling. Then there's the person who builds and decorates birdhouses for sale elsewhere in some commercial districts. Such an operation might be only part-time but involve an assembly line. This also would require a special exception or be prohibited entirely in the village residential and medium residential districts. 
repairs would be small scale manufacturing because most operations would be unique and not require an assembly line. <coughs> Clock, watch, and jewel repairs, to name but a few, would be, be likewise by special exception only or only or permitted altogether. Sorry about that. Um, does our town really want to be known as being so totally anti-business that the Girl Scouts cannot make and sell cupcakes, the Boy Scouts cannot earn an environmental badge for building a bat house, or the 4-H club being prevented from cooking and bottling maple syrup as a fundraiser? Sincerely, James Croxy. Um, could I just, I, I, I spoke with uh, Mr. Cropsey when he submitted this letter, and um, I think what, what I said to him was that a lot of the things he lists here um, would actually are, are being permitted to a greater extent through this am amendment. And I think when he saw the notice, his reaction was to think that it was restrict like minimum like lessening options in town and I said in my mind it's opening up options it's creating the ability to you know do some of these things he lists um, <coughs> anyway, that, that was what I said to him um, I guess if I could just I do I, I definitely agree um, that a modification that probably makes sense is to say in the industrial district it should be allowed by right, not by special exception. Um, the other thing is maybe I would, based on what he's, he's, he's mentioning agricultural, maybe there should be a note in the definition that says something like um, agricultural uses may be exempt from special exception requirements, because they probably are through state law. Thank you. We also allow home businesses. Good point. And so, ah, sorry. Right. Involving yeah. the manufacturer. <laughs> yeah. So, if we happen? adopt this, we're contradicting. Who we already allow. I don't think so. I well, think now it's saying this is, if you're going to do light manufacturing, a small scale manufacturing, it's got to have a special exception. But if you can say. But yet. <laughs> if you can do it as a home business, and I, I think that's. A, no, the downtown so, district does. That's why we're doing this, I thought. Because you can't have a brewery downtown. Right. That was the whole, I thought. Yeah. This is for light manufacturing. Right. We allow home businesses to have okay. a dwelling, it says, an accessory use of a dwelling unit involving the manufacture provision for sale of goods and or services. Okay. So they can manufacture goods in a home business. But a downtown business isn't a home business. So if I, I, let's say I'm down, let's say I live downtown. Yep. Or let's say, yeah, what yep. do you, yep. or even in the you. village area. And I I'm, let's say I manufacture I don't know, lotions, or ma I'm making soap, making soap at home, and I sell it. That's manufacturing. That's so now we're going to have to have a special allowed. exception. But it's not allowed for shops. Oh. I don't have a shop. I'm in my apartment no, 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 making no. soap, and I sell it. I'm manufacturing. Well, I get you. Yes. It's allowed right now. But it's not allowed <coughs> for a downtown store, correct? This doesn't say it. <clears throat> No. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is we want to allow that. It's already allowed as a home business. No, it's not a, but it's not a home business if they're a storefront down. But what I'm saying is with this, that home business now has to get a special exception oh, right. to do what they're already allowed so, in their zoning. Okay. It's a contradiction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, good point, Cap. Yeah. So, um, the intent, what the way I envision this working is that if you can qualify as a home business, and that's pretty restrictive, you know, it, it just basically it says it can't look anything like a business, and, and you still need to do site plan review. If, if you can qualify as a home business, to me, then you're in, and you're not sub, you're not subject <laughs> to 
small scale manufacturing requirements because you're, 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 we're gonna call you a home business. I think though that based on what, if, if so if, if you guys agree with that approach, then I can improve the language of this to, to maybe add a note that makes that clear. To say, if you qualify as a home business, don't worry about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think you have to also, the agricultural portion, because you're contradicting state yeah, law. Yeah, The same thing. I could be so, making maple syrup in my garage, which I, is allowed. I, I, two yeah. questions. <clears throat> Number one, using the example you just used, I don't live in rural agriculture, right? Well, let's say I go out and I pick 500 pints of strawberries, and I make strawberry jam to sell in my kitchen or my basement in my manufacturing mm -hmm. or my home business. Just me. Maybe, maybe I think right. Right. You are manufacturing so, in your home. I can't stand any of that. So so. But I think, I think we should tailor this to say that if you can qualify as a home business, you yeah. don't have, you're, you're in at that. You're in as a home so, business. My example I just gave, am I a home business or am I mean? Well, you turn to the home business section of the ordinance and go down the list and say, you know, does uh -huh. it look like a strawberry manufacturing plant? Does it, you know, it basically, the home business is very restrictive and it basically says, again, you, no one, none of your neighbors should ever know that you're, I mean, that's not the exact wording, but it kind well, of. Maybe I, get, maybe I get all my <laughs> jelly jars delivered by UPS five times a week, because all of a sudden. It, can, that's addressed in the home business section. Yes, it is. It is. And you can have people coming and going and buying it. But oh, if you're okay. manufacturing it, and you take it to a store to sell, you are manufacturing, but you're still a home business. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go with my part two of my question. So growing up, my mom used to do silk screening in, her, in, in our kitchen. Got shirt orders, t-shirt orders, right? She mm -hmm. probably wore one. Whether or not she realized it or not, she probably did. But she used to do silk screening. And she would you know, do the silk screening in the kitchen, she'd do the photo film, she'd pull the slide around the counter, Clip the light, photo film, or whatever, however that worked. And then she'd go downstairs and she'd iron it. You know, it was all, but no one from my house wouldn't know that. My no, and that, that would be a home business under ours. Mm -hmm. But is it manufacturing? Yes. What? Yes. You're it manufacturing is, but, product is. But as a home business. But I'm not, again, the only thing that she ever had was UPS come up. Yeah. Drop off, you know, boxes of shirts. Take up my bedroom. I, I have a lot of problems with the home business thing, and it's not on. But I'm trying to do, deal with it last year. Yeah. Uh, what, <laughs> if you do, if you sell something on eBay, I mean, you know, you're a home business, so uh, you should be coming in. That means, just like the uh, unenforceable thing, that mm. the 11 p.m. Sh shut off. Everybody's got a home, possibly a home business, and wow. it's that's really right. annoying to me. Because but that's already allowed. But that's not germane. That's already allowed. Right. It's right there, no, page forty-two and forty-two. Yeah. Right. It's I already know. allowed. Yeah. I, it's but it is restrictive. It's, 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 it's very restrictive. In. Yeah. And and that's why you know let's, we don't have to harp on that. Anyway, yeah, um, right. it sounds like all of you are kind of. I don't want to make assumptions, but. To what what's, we're talking about here is, is um, saying that if you can qualify as a home business, you don't need to undergo the special exception process. So, if do we do, does the board agree that I should write something up that addresses that, and that'll be what we either put forward or take to our second hearing, or that's that's what you guys want. I would like you to include something the agricultural portion. I, I have well. that. I have. Um, we're going to allow it by, so changes to this amendment would be, we're going to allow it by right in industrial. And the reason for that is, you know, Jim's comment is right on the money. Um, if you think about it, we allow light manufacturing and heavy manufacturing in industrial by right. We shouldn't create an added hurdle for doing something lesser, you know, lesser impact. So that would be one. Another would be to add a note that agriculture uses may be exempt from the special exception requirement, mm -hmm. and three, that um, if you qualify as a home business, you you will be, 
how do I want to say this? Basically, if you qualify as a home business, you qualify as a home business. You're not a, you're not a small manufacturing entity. Where does that leave the people in downtown? In what? Where does that leave? Uh, business owners in down in the downtown district who want to have a bakery. They're they're a they're a small scale manufacturing because they they can't get in as a home business because it's not a home. Right, so they are allowed by special. Exception. They would be by special exception. Yeah. Right. So and, do we even want to have to make them have to get an exception for that? Well, if, I think so because we we. We, it's hard to know exactly what types of nuisances could come out of this. So if we don't require a special exception and we just let people, anyone who falls in this, you know, one or two, one sentence definition can just, you know, go in there. Um, well, I mean, I guess you would have site plan review. Um, I don't know. I, I want to roll. I want to just speak my mind. Keep rolling. So, using the example that Jules just said, using the bakery, we would prove at some point to at least two businesses to have residences in the back of the businesses on Main Street. And if they're a bakery living in the back, does that make it a home business? No, because it doesn't look like a home, it looks like a business. Why? Part of the home business um, requirement is it doesn't look it from the outside. It doesn't have signage, it doesn't have Well, that's okay. interesting. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. restaurants are manufacturing food. They already come in for site plan, but they don't want to yeah. make them get a special exception. I mean, uh, what if we said, so let's pick, I mean, maybe let's go with, with Jim, sort of Jim's comments. Uh, He's saying re RC district, GC district, and downtown districts. Maybe that would would maybe sounds like his suggestion would be add those to the list of districts where it's allowed by right, and they go right in for site plan review. Sounds good, man. Okay. Which ones would be by by right? So now it would be in addition to the industrial, um, we'd be add. Um, RC, re, uh, excuse me, RG, Regional Commercial, GC, which is General Commercial, and DN, Downtown, those three districts. And then after that, he also contemplates, <clears throat> well, no. I don't know. To me, that makes sense. You know, and the why other wouldn't ones, you allow it in resort commercial? What's that? Why wouldn't you allow it in resort yeah. commercial? Because I think you already have it, especially in the Winnesquam section. Okay. So RC, RG, downtown, and GC, and industrial. So. Anywhere but rural agricultural, village residential, medium residential. Uh, okay. And then, so. Hmm. Mixed use. And what about mixed use? So mixed use and RA would be special exception. RG, RC, GC, downtown, and industrial would be by right. And not permitted, potentially, would be VR and MR. So the only one I question on that, and I don't, I say question, I'm not sure, is RC, Resort Commercial. I wonder whether that should require a special exception. I think Kaplan makes the point that it's, um, would you say it's already pretty much there? In some places, isn't it? Yeah. That, I mean, that when you true. have those mixed neighborhoods, especially along Route 3. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's where, that's where it's problematic. I mean, if it's already there, then the, actually, if it's already there, they're grandfathered, right? And yeah. they can continue doing it. Yeah. So now you have to think of, okay, you're going to allow others to do it there because they're already doing it there? Or it means the zoning board is going to give them a variance anyway because it's already there. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah special. I, I guess 
I lean a little bit towards special exception requirement and resort commercial because you could have something right up against mm -hmm. a residential. That I mean, the likelihood in RC is higher than the others. Uh -huh. So, so well, it's like okay, I'm in RC. Of course, by farm it wouldn't be allowed in RC. It just was created around me. Oh yeah. So I'm grandfathered, right. yeah. but. You know, I'm cons well. You you would have agriculture exempt anyway, so I guess that's not a good example. Oh. Do you have anything to? Get lines there. So, what do you, so what do you guys think of that? Um, by right in RC. Sorry. <laughs> by, by right in RG, GC, downtown, and industrial, by special exception in mixed use and RA, not permitted in VR and MR, and I'm suggesting special exception in RC, but that's the one we have, I guess. How about that? Special exception in RC as well. I mean, I would lean towards uh, by right more so than not, just because it's so hard to enforce and it's such it's a gray area still. That whole section of Winnesquam is RC. Where's the start? It looks like it starts at Lancaster Hill. Goes all the way out to the Mosquito Bridge. Yeah. Now, I mean, you've got somebody that has, you've got a shop there that sold bread. Right, yeah. Well, I could buy honey bakes, down there. Honey. Yeah. Bakes something. I can go down in RC and buy bread. maple it's syrup. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about what we can purchase. It's, just it's being made there. Yeah. So, you know, this guy who's got hives, I can go down there and buy his honey. Right. I, mean, it, I don't know if the bread was being cooked is he there. Agriculture? No. no, he's an RC. No, is he considered an agriculture no. doing honey? I don't. He's not a farm. I don't know. Yeah. Is he, I'm, I'm curious if he's protected under state statute. I don't know. Yes. And his hides are all over the place. They're not. Um, he rents them out. Um, of the different permitting processes that one might undergo with one of our boards. Special exception is probably the easiest, you know, when you take subdivision, site plan review, variance, special exception. Special exception is the easiest, actually sometimes by far. And so let's take the RC district. Somebody pays their fee, they notify the abutters, they come in, they prove that they meet the special exception criteria. The abutters get notified, they get to show up. Before it comes to the planning board, it's the, the vetting of whether it fits in the neighborhood has been accomplished. So you guys aren't taking on this site plan review case where right up from right off the bat you have to answer the question of whether this this use results in no or no impact or minimal impact to the surrounding properties. It seems appropriate to me that that be its own isolated hearing where the zoning board, again, and the abutters focus in on whether this use should, should be something that can go before the planning board. And I so don't think RC should, I think RC should be allowed now that I'm looking at it because this piece is a property down there. It's like, this property that was a buddy mine, yeah, a very difficult time for years trying to sell it because really? okay. we allowed it so much. But okay, sorry. And then you have, I mean, I can think of a number of properties along Route Three that are vacant today because there's not much you can do down there. Yeah. So why wouldn't you allow, allow light manufacturing? It's a okay. small business. You still have to have site plan. You still have to site plan. Exactly. And you know, anybody that lives in that area knows it's a it's a multiple use area. 
it's not like the residential neighborhoods. I just think, you know, it'd be nice to get some of those properties on the tax roll. Because we don't have many of them so, left. Like, it's so restrictive, <laughs> small scales. Uh, you're baking bread. Oh, okay. The, the thing is, it, I, okay, the, it, this can work. What it's gonna, it, it is gonna require that the code enforcement officer, potentially me, and the planning board be prepared to, to evaluate right off, right from the top, whether whatever this person is proposing results in no impact or minimal impact. You know, there won't be that zoning board process to make that determination off the front. But that's you know. But we you do, guys that do that anyway. all the time. Yeah, you're you're pros at it. I mean, it, we do that. Like with the, low, the property across from Lowe's. Sure, absolutely. I mean, it, it's. And if we don't, shame on us. Okay. That's so, just my opinion. So, what I have is permitted in RGRC GC downtown industrial, special exception in mixed use in RA, and not permitted in VR and MR. Yes, that's. All right. Amendment number six. Are you in favor of the adoption of amendment number six as proposed by the planning board for the town zoning ordinance as follows? Comprehensively amend article 13, floodplain development ordinance approved by the planning board. I'm okay. sorry, that shouldn't say that. That's okay. Well, <laughs> hang on to that. For me. <laughs> Uh, why the change? These changes were recommended by the New Hampshire Office of Strategic Initiatives, the agency responsible for overseeing New Hampshire's national flood insurance program activities. You don't have long enough. Everybody will need a pillow. But this is online for anybody that chooses to read it, right? Sorry? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, no, but I'll put it online. Please. Yeah. And if anybody couldn't make it tonight and has an interest in reviewing prior to the next meeting, I'll have mm -hmm. that opportunity. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. residential care facility. Add to Article 2 definitions the following term. Residential care facility, a residential facility providing social services in a protective living environment for adults or children, including group or foster care homes, shelters for abused children or adults, drug and alcohol counseling facilities, and intermediate care facilities licensed and according with all applicable requirements of the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Revise Article 6.1.B.6 to replace the term residential adult care facility with the term residential care facility. Why the change? Last year, a petition zoning article was submitted and approved at town meeting regulating placement of residential adult care facilities through the Charter of Permitted Uses. In defining term, 
the planning board concluded that many of the same factors surrounding an adult residential facility might also surround a similar facility serving teens or children. This amendment would expand the designation to include residential care facilities serving individuals of any age. Any input from anyone? Are you in favor of the adoption of Amendment 8 as proposed by the Planning Board for the Town Zone Ordinance as follows? Amend Article 11 to enumerate an additional special exception criterion stipulating that operations in conjunction with a use proposed for special exception approval shall not be more objectionable to surrounding properties than would be operation of uses permitted by right in the district. Move and renumber current Article 11.8.7 shown below to Article 11.4.8 placed immediately after current Article 11.4.7. Operations in conjunction with such a use shall not be more objectionable to nearby properties by reason of noise, fumes, odor, or vibration than would be the operation of any permitted uses in the district which are not subject to special exception procedures. Why the change? The language of the current Article 11.8.7 establishes an approval criterion that is not currently listed alongside the six other special exception criteria. Grouping this criterion with the others will clarify the Zoning Board of Adjustment's responsibilities when ruling upon special exception requests. Again, uh, compliments to Sheena for that. This was her catch. And good job. Thus finishes amendments. What is that? <laughs> so we meet again on um, January 22nd. We've got a uh, lot line adjustment and uh, I think a conceptual for Anchorage. And, um, and I'm trying to remember if I think we'll probably hold the hearing then. I just need to double check to make sure that meets the, there's supposed to be a certain amount of time between the two hearings. I just need to double check to make, make sure, sure that satisfies that. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So most likely it'll be two weeks from now. Does anyone have any other business that needs to be brought up this evening? I, I just want to know. Get a sense of you guys. Um, a neighbor brought up to me about looking into, and I'm sure you've heard in Laconia, they they looked into short-term rentals as it, as as it re regards uh, Airbnbs and whether to allow that sort of thing. And I don't have an answer yet, but it's definitely one of those current Probably issues. Probably should the lady that has to deal with. I didn't hear. Oh, um, Airbnbs and short-term rentals yeah. and law. Whether to allow or how to allow that sort of thing. In Laconia, they just pass something or not. Pass. We don't specifically have anything about Airbnbs. They just be treated like motel, yeah. hotel, you know, right. transient lodging. Because that, that's what it is, it's transient lodging. Sure. Short-term rentals, I know, and I don't necessarily have an answer to that either, but the possibility of in, in being in the Lakes region and having so much subletting, so to speak, I guess, happening all, all the time, um, and noise, I guess it's, to me it comes down to more of like a noise and nuisance sort of thing. Yeah. Wouldn't our chart of permitted uses, <coughs> excuse me, control somebody <coughs> living in one of the uh, residential areas, renting out their home as a transient facility? I, I, I don't really think we view it, I don't think we view anything, like if somebody <coughs> lives in a house for a day, I don't think we regulate it any different if they live in it for 30 years. I, 
and, and I... It's if I rent out my house. So it, what we would uh, have to do yeah, is actually I create guess. a definition for Airbnb. Yeah, I, I guess <clears throat> my thought might be to not do anything about it at this time because it's not oh, yeah. presenting oh, problems. Yeah. I was just get okay, so yeah. they Food made it, thought. and I yeah. quote me on this, but it was like, don't do anything, and I don't even know if this is legal or not. It sounds a little sketchy. They're not going to enforce anything unless there's a problem. And then, if there's a problem, then they're going to say they're going to enforce the no short term rental rule. Yeah. I wish I had brought the article. Well, we don't have a no short term rental rule. Right. Yeah, that's why I'm no, saying I mean, that's a possibility. So everybody could put yeah. tiny houses on their property now with the new accessory value <clears> units and Airbnb. Yeah, and do do we? Yeah, I mean, so it's it's a, it's food for thought as all. Well. It, it's yeah. a good point, I guess. You know, I'm not. Yeah, it's a tough one because if you're not seeing it as a nuisance. But New Hampshire is a, um, you know, lots of term. I mean, so let's say I'm going to go out and I'm going to rent a house. Because I, you know, I need a place to live, but I want to rent a house. I can get a, I, I don't get a contract from my landlord for a year or five years. It's month to month. Yeah. Well, let's say I don't like where I'm living and I move out in a week. Well, What's the difference? Right. It may, so do we may, if we make a regulation that says no short-term rentals, well, where does that fall into? I think you'd have to just be very specific if you're going to do something. Yeah. And it have to be. I can I can get you the, the, the rule and yeah. just just for just for thought um, because you know around the lakes you know around okay. If we have a big place going in with little uh, tiny homes, quote, quote unquote, there's going to be a lot of that going on, and these people aren't. Is it, there, there tends to be a little bit of a problem where you have no owner there, sometimes with rowdiness, noise, etc., nuisance. Um, but doesn't it say accessory so. dwellings require the owner to be living in the property? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about accessory dwellings. Talking about I'm talking about house. short term rentals. Well, what's the difference if I rent my house out and I rent it to rowdy people? I rent it to her and she's rowdy. Well, that's, she that's where you can do something more. This is what the rule is about. Well, if I just rent my house out, you can't control them what they do. If you pass that's these what power is to look for. That's, that's what I'm no, saying. We have a police that <clears> We have a noise <throat> ordinance. We have um, uh, nuisance. nuisance. We have fireworks. We have, I mean, we have all sorts of ordinances that would help protect against some of that. Yeah, this is an added protection. I'm just saying if we develop, say you developed along that area, not specifying the anchorage, but. And then all these people are renting out there. And I'm not saying for or against this, but renting out their little trailers and the owners aren't there and it's it'd be okay say it's a repeat offender sort of situation where this one owner is constantly laying out their place to habitually offender you know somebody who's in a, constantly causing a problem this law gives them some teeth to say you can no longer rent it out and sublet it that's what they did in Laconia something what along those lines what did they do that? Okay. I think that they had the police there often enough. Well, I think that's the point, is that they don't. Doesn't the house, the way the house touches on that? Well, uh, I'm sorry, I was reading temper. I was reading transient. So if, if, if I, as a landlord, if I constantly rent out to nuisance renters, causing the disturbance, having the police constantly there, Putting a burden on town services, if you will. That's um, does, that, does the housing housing ordinance cover any of that? No, that would be under the disorderly ordinance. Yeah, so they could just keep on doing it. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you situations right now where that exists <laughs> right now in town. I know at least three of them so right now. So it would be short-term rental people. Well, remember, New Hampshire is short-term anyway, unless you have a contract. Is that what you're looking at? Is that well? Um, so 
unless you have a contractual agreement that says I get to lease this house or apartment for a year or whatever. Most of the ones that I see are month to month, not short term. Yeah, and then, I mean, I don't know if they're all prob problem children. So. No, but I know of at least three right now that are regular. I mean, I get calls regularly right. about partying late into the night, for dogs barking, to smells, and all kinds of stuff. And I constantly have to refer them to the police. Yeah. And then, but then nothing really gets done. Well, the police yeah. go there. The police They're just known, you know, bullseye. Right. You know, one of them was right down in Lockmere, just a stone throw for me. And eventually the police were there so many times that they decided to take their rowdiness someplace else. Thank God. So would this be like a, a housing standard board thing? No. It would be a cleaning board thing. Well, I'll get the article and like I said, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know the answer for sure, but... be interesting looking. Yeah. But sometimes such a thing is too much regulation. Yeah, but overreaching. Anybody else? Look for your dog. Here we go. <laughs> but it would be interesting to look at. Maybe a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn and a second. All those in favor? Aye. It's non debatable. <laughs> As Joe would say, Thank you. thanks a lot. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask if anybody felt we should have a second public hearing because of the weather. Oh, it looks like we are. Oh. Because you guys didn't. Oh, blow because up. we. Yeah. yeah. And I think the. We changed the. We changed it enough. Yeah. The, the amendment number five enough, <laughs> and that's the one I got to send out another 180 letters on. So that's <laughs> that was the one I was hoping maybe we could call done today. That's, <laughs> that's all right. No, this is good. That was a good meeting. Good progress. We had progress. Yeah. Just gonna leave all this right here. Get it in mind. <laughs>